Yes. Hello, can you hear me? And is it hey. happening in real time? Yes, we are. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, my I guess my iPad is being a little weird this morning. Just doesn't want to cooperate, eh? No, it does not. Good morning, Martin. How are you? Good. I'm wonderful. So you got kicked out of a Montessori, you were starting to say? <laughs> yeah, I, in seventh grade. I only went for one year. Um, but yeah, I got kicked out of Montessori school. Um, I didn't speak French, and they were teaching French. And I came in at seventh grade, and I had never even began to ever learn French. And um, yeah, they were really mean to me. And um, <laughs> I'm I'm a little bit of a troublemaker, too. So I, I, I brought them um, their policy issues they needed to change when I was like 12. No one was listening wow. to me. And um, yeah, I was asked not to come back. And um, yeah, so that was my one uh, moment in private school in my K through 12th education. Wow. My dad tried. My dad tried. He was like, there's a school that opened. Not so much. <laughs> and did that start your crusade towards inclusion and everything <laughs> as a result of that? I, that came much later, but I, okay. I stayed with that same mentality of um, speaking back, asking questions, being skeptical. Um, I think I, I organized a walkout in eighth grade before I, I, I just wish at a younger age, somebody would have explained to me what community organizing was. Right. Um, Cause I didn't know. And I, I internalized that I was bad. I mean, in, mm. in eighth grade, I was told by adults that I was doing the wrong thing and that I was bad multiple times for having, for organizing walkouts, for organizing people to speak up and stand up against things. I always got backlash that was negative. And I think yes. that that's super bad um, reinforcement. Um, of course. So now when I speak out, even as an adult, I have a moment where I have to recover physically and emotionally. I'm also mm -hmm. neuro neurodivergent. So I think differently than a lot of people. So it's a big, I seem like a very, um, big personality that's a big extrovert but I'm actually super shy and I need a long right. time to like rebuild after I let all the stuff yes. out yes great <laughs> I do crazy. I do want to say one thing Martin sure so yes. I I actually use uh pronouns that are they them and I do not identify as a woman or a female I'm actually non-binary and gender non-conforming and I know you didn't know that and a lot of people look at me and they assume with my hair or my appearance because people are very visual based I actually don't identify that way um, and I know you didn't know but I just wanted to let you know so when we're on this conversation you don't refer to me as she and her because it's okay. just like it takes me a moment and I'm like whoo it doesn't sit in my tummy <laughs> well um but you know nobody knows and we're a very visual based society and that visual goes into potties a lot so yes. and and it's not how I've always identified so I just wanted okay. to, to say that just so I was a little bit more comfortable sure um and I, I I like conversations like this where we can just like this is it this is where we're at did I use an incorrect pronoun in, in my intro or are you saying that pro proactively yeah in um your pre thing that you spoke about in your stories saying she and her and it's just like okay. people just do this it's just like natural yes. right they're filler yes. words we're so right. such a binary based society so i always give people lots of wiggle room because yes i totally understand and especially i used to have long hair just literally yesterday so it's it's hard <laughs> okay. for people um it yes. really is hard for them so I just wanted, so you knew, um, I, appreciate I just, that. I feel like it's so important for people to s explain those things, you know? Yes, absolutely. Can you, um, can we talk about that for those who have no clue what you're talking about? Cause I mean, some people are very, very conscious of this and very, uh, I, with lack of better, I can't find the word to say it, but like are very conscientious of that and others just glaze over it like I did, even though I did read your pronouns and was very conscientious to say your name as opposed to even use one. Because I think that honoring someone with their name is probably even higher than recognizing a pronoun, would you not say? I mean, they're, they're, they're the same because that's my identity. My pronoun yes. is part of my identity. So okay. to, me, to me, it's more about... Um, like inclusion is intersectional mm -hmm. and you know, cause we're not just one thing static in a vacuum. We're more than one thing. And um, 
So to me, it's like my pronouns, my identity. People say, oh, this is my preference. No, these are what I use in my okay. daily life. Yes. And this is how I want somebody to communicate with me. Um, yes. And I think it comes back to, you know, um, pronouns and in, in, in putting pronouns out there is just a way to show people that this is a welcoming space for people who are gender non-conforming. So people who are mm -hmm. gender non-conforming do not see themselves on the gender binary. So... I don't see myself as a man or as a woman, and I am completely rejecting this uh, socially constructed ideology that says I can only be one of two things. And okay. I see gender as more fluid. And then this will maybe do a little bit of like brain bursting for some people, but sexuality and, and gender identity are two separate concepts. And I think that's really important for people to learn too, is like mm -hmm. I'm married to, um, someone who identifies as a man and um, people are going to look at us and see somebody who's, you know, appears to be assigned female at birth and someone who's a male and they're going to assume, you know, that I maybe want to be gendered that way, but we don't know. And I think that's, that's such a wonderful way to start a conversation. You know, yes. if somebody says, uh, this is how I identify. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for informing me. And it's, it's almost like, I don't know, it just makes people feel seen. And that's, I think, what a lot of us want. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, and people definitely want to be seen and heard. And the conversations like this, even seeing the comments, like, I love that we're having this convo. It's good to know. These are things that we need to be aware of. Like, it's much like all the conversations amidst a racial awakening. When we have these conversations with people and we start to dialogue about privilege or supremacy and stuff, there's people who just want to be aware and how can I put this nothing comes out of malice and so I really appreciate the fact that you want to open with that and this is these are my this is the way that I identify it's great yeah and it's mo mostly because external society is telling me no a lot mm -hmm. to this and um it it doesn't make me feel any less of that. I don't need my validation to come from outside of me, but I do have right. a, a point where it's like, well, I respect everyone around me. So I would like, you know, that same thing in return. So I think it's all about teaching each other about our, our boundaries. You know, I don't think mm -hmm. we should ever be walking on eggshells for anyone. I believe in direct communication and I don't think communication is uh, divisive. I think people choose how they want to be divisive. Um, I read this amazing book in college that was all about how life is all conflict. So if you're avoiding conflict, yes. you're avoiding life. And, yes. and, <laughs> and so you have to figure out, is this something that you escalate or deescalate? And life is all a series of figuring out how to manage these escalations and deescalations. Because you're yes. not going to get to the iteration you want unless you push through these really challenging things. And I've just always been someone that's, I don't know, really able to have these conversations. And I know it's because of the work that I've done in the past, because I've just, you know, did a lot of direct service jobs that were, you realized what was happening in the world around you really quickly. And I yes. think that that changes your kind of outer world view, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that relates back to, you know, the political links in my bio. And yes. I have an MPA, I have a background in public affairs and community organizing. So that's what I did for years. Um, I quit my last job um, in August 2019, working in that field. And I resigned from a city commissioner position and doing work with the um, Democratic Party and stuff like that. And just stepped away because um, I needed a break. And that yes. whole time, the last five years, even as I was doing this work in the community, um, I was also teaching Pilates on the side part time. And it was more like a side hustle. And it was almost sneaky because sometimes I couldn't tell my <laughs> boss. No, I, yes. I would have to be like, oh, I have a community meeting. And would I go teach my evening class? Because yes. cause people, it wasn't A, it was moonlighting or whatever. Right. And then... Um, people I'm not from a background that would normally normally go into Pilates so I think that that 
made it harder for me to tell the people around me that I was a Pilates teacher, which is so weird. But for I fear have... of people like challenging you, well, you don't look like a Pilates person sort of thing. Well, that was from the Pilates field. I was getting more from my own, you know, working in politics and the people I was organizing with. It's more like you have three degrees. What are you doing? Yes. Well, why are you teaching Pilates now? You're not like when I think of Pilates, I think of a former ballerina, a gymnast, an athlete. You know, right. I if I'm an athlete, I'm a, I'm a you know like a math lead or something. I'm not. I right. I mean, yes. that's so. That's the perception. Shocked. Yes. People are like, you're a community organizer. You can go teach a workshop on how to, you know, get a city commissioner job or how to talk about your story. You know, this is this is what you do. You don't teach people Pilates. But I stumbled into Pilates. I literally like ended up on the block of a Pilates studio twice, living and just kept looking at it. Okay. And it was like, what is the studio? What do they do here? And it took me a long time to work up the courage to actually enter and mm. try it out. And it's such a smart, um, very interesting and intricate methodology and modality of movement. And I think just the way my personality is that I related to that. I related to this like, it's linear in a sense. Well, Rachel, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Because yeah, I, I had this, I had this flashback as you were talking about just stumbling upon the, the the doorsteps of this Pilates studio. When I was living downtown, I was walking up Danforth, and there was a Pilates studio on the second floor. And I walked up. I'm, I think I might have been training at the time. Maybe it was in social work. I can't remember when. But I walked up the stairs, went to this Pilates studio, and I talked to the lady for a moment and said, like, you know, what is this? And she said, oh, it's kind of like a, this fitness thing for dancers. And there's a picture of a woman on, you know, on the wall doing some arabesque or something. Now I know it's an arabesque. And I was like, okay, well, thank you for your time and walked out. And it was years before I touched Pilates. And it wasn't necessarily that I thought that was bad. I just thought because she initially initially you know connected it with dancers that well peace out that's not for me what is your elevator pitch for Pilates if someone was to come to you right now and said what is Pilates what do you do what's your life I would say what do you do in your every a day average life are you sitting at your desk are you going on a run every other day or do you play basketball what do you do in your life are you out talking to people are you standing up for your job are you sitting and i would say whatever you do in your life pilates is going to make you more efficient at that are you a yogi it's going to make you more efficient at being a yogi um i just had an experience where someone said that they've never gotten into a boat pose ever we were rolling around in doing um, a, a variation of rolling like a ball. They okay. stuck, they got into that position and it was like a boat like position because we were holding our legs more open, like an open leg rocker like type open thing, leg rocker. But, but with bent knees just to give more space and to roll around. And they held it and they were like, this is boat pose and yoga. Mm you know, between yes. the holding in between the motion areas and hold and being able to, and, and they said they've been doing yoga for years and they've never had that experience. So to yes. me, um, Pilates is going to make you more efficient at whatever you do. And it's going to help um, get into some area of your body that you maybe didn't even feel. And it might right. take time, but there's going to be epiphany moments. Um, and it's just fun and exciting to roll around. You know, this is the, yes. this is, this is the place where you're going to be able to act like a kid, you know, who, when are you going to roll around like an egg on the ground? You know, and, and I think that this is really important yes. for a lot of people are really in, um, they're really in their body. They're um, not outwardly, maybe they're kind of overthinking about each move. That's how I was when I started. Right. Every time I'd be like, is my palm facing the right way? Like I was couldn't even figure out how to really tap into my Pilates self because I was so mm. inhibited with people's ideology about Pilates, you know, yes. and a lot of it came from being overly internal cued. Right. From being like, you should feel this we, here. 
Yes, we, we, we spoke about this yesterday. And one is over queuing and two is being afraid of silence. We, we feel like we need to fill the air at every second. I've definitely been uh, one for that. I mean, but it's, it depends on where you're at, where you're at. Yeah, I'm a talker right. for sure. And it, it depends where you're at because if you're online and you're teaching a class of 25 people, you need to keep that dialogue going. So even if you're not cueing an exercise the whole time, you should be talking and, and, and weaving in a story or, you know, I mean, I, I think it, it really depends on your audience, but there's yes. some audience. So I teach a class on Tuesday. I'm not going to be silent for three minutes, maybe mm -hmm. with my private client or some of my duets, then I can get quiet because we have a different working kind of, um, what they expect out of me and what they're going to get. And then if I'm in a class, this is, this is somewhat entertaining. You know, this isn't just yeah. about the movement. This is about us connecting and you feeling so jazzed up about everything we're doing. And you're not going to do that if I'm like having giant gaps of silence. Yeah. Yeah. Every, there's so many different teaching styles and I love the way that you present. Like I can imagine your classes are, informative and entertaining not just fluffy entertainment no and i like to catch myself so i say sometimes i'll say just or only and those are words mm -hmm. i want to take out because they to me they're so heavy mm -hmm. they have you know just one more or only and i'm really anti anything about being harder or easier i believe okay. in i don't use the word modification I only okay. see it sometimes in books. I use variation and options. And I yes. do that because some people who come into to, um, movement hear modification in a negative way. And it mm. almost gut punches them in a way because they're like, I'm less than, I can't do the exercise. Well, the exercise is actually not just this one apex of it. Yes. And, and, right. and if you always just look at, oh, I need to reach the apex, then – that can be, it's not, it's exclusive. It's elitist. It's this specific thing and it looks a certain way. And mm. um, how do we get away from that? Well, we look at the work more organically and more holistically and dynamic that each part can really be um, work for the person. You know, I'm a community organizer. Yes. It sounded like you said you used to be a social worker. and. Yes. So you know this is about working with people where they're at. You don't drag yes. people along. You don't tell people what their goals are or what their needs are. We have mm -hmm. to have that working relationship where people tell us what their yes. needs are. Because there's a paternal – you're in Canada. I don't know if it's the same as in the United States, but we are very paternalistic. Mm -hmm. people, people really love to have an opinion about other people's lives yet they don't yes. want to like vote for us to have, you know, a better economic state, you know, or like healthcare, like stuff like that. Right. So it really doesn't make any sense because people have all these opinions about other people, but they don't really want to support and encourage people. And yes. so to me, my work is really about, I mean, when I started, one of my mentors would say, teach to the highest level in class. Mm. No. no, what? Yeah. And, yeah. and it, but that's, and if you're teaching 500 people or whatever, every couple of years and, or you're pumping out students and they're not like me and they're, they didn't go and interact with different people that challenge these ideas a lot and maybe yes. come up with something else and look at my manuals and go, these are, these are Cracker Jack books. Like this isn't the real stuff. I have it's to go seek this enough. information. Right. It's not, it, it, you know, it used the word obese in one of these, you know, mm -hmm. that's a, I'm just going to say it, that's a BS term. No one should be saying obese or any of that stuff anymore. We, we can't, you can't look at someone and see health size does not equate to health. Mm -hmm. um, if we're so focused on the size and shape of our bodies and other people's bodies, then we're really not getting at, you know, building our body and building what's in our body. And I don't like to say the mind body connection because they're connected. My mind's in my body already. I don't really need right. to add it there. Um, right. But I don't know. I just, I just feel like there's an elitist kind of, this is visually what a teaser looks like. You know, mm -hmm. someone, someone pulled, I, I broke down a teaser and gave options, like having a teaser with your feet on 
on the wall or your feet on a chair and then getting used to just lifting it and building that strength. And right. um, that person who was bullying people, I don't want to say their name, um, uh, they pulled a video of mine and was like, this is not a teaser. You can't teach like that. Well, why? Mm -hmm. Would you put someone on the mat and expect them to do just the entire thing and then be frustrated when they don't? People can sense that. Yes. And, and I, I really worry that we're turning people off, not me and you, but just in general in the Pilates field that people like someone who walked in, oh, it's for dancers. You walked upstairs and they're like, yeah, this is for dancers. So that made it niche. Yeah. Yeah, you can work with your niche population, but don't tell random people who come off the street that that's what Pilates is. Mm -hmm. Because now, now you made it, you didn't make it this whole encompassing thing. We got to have right. this wide view. When you talk to a brand new person, you wide view them. Right. This is the, yeah. And then when they come in, you're like, oh, you run? We're going to work on this. And then I'm going to explain to you what she running is, you know? Right. Or, right. You know, but we don't have that chance to create that dialogue if we're like, this is for dancers. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not... I don't have a background in dance, so I think that's why it's a big one for me, is um, I have never been a trained dancer. I took a ballet class once when I was five, I think, and my mom couldn't <laughs> afford it, so yes. I didn't continue to go. And right. I mean, I think I think I could have got a lot out of that. I think it would have probably helped me in my life to have some more structure, um, especially when I was younger. But um, I think it's so helpful to just believe that Pilates really is for every person. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a former gymnast or you have to be a specific dancer. And, you know, because that's the majority of the people in it, when you go to studios and you see people create these, you know, Beautiful really shapes. graceful. Yeah. It's very intimidating. Mm. It's, it's extremely intimidating when you're, when I, I fall walking upstairs sometimes, you know, yes. and, and someone's like move, two limbs separately in different directions. And then my brain's like, what just happened? But the, right. the, the magic part is when you do this over time for years, all of a sudden, one day, maybe some of it will show up and not just visually, but in your body. You know, one right. day I just could tell where my shoulder was and where it needed to be. And right. it just kind of, it just hit. Before it was like, bring your shoulders, do this with your shoulders, do that with your shoulders. And they just were living in a world of their own. And then one day, and it, and it was during pandemic even, you know, mm -hmm. like seven years into practice or six years into practice, I finally started feeling certain things because I wasn't in an environment where I was being told what to feel and kind of what to think in right. some ways and what to say. So does that circle back to that mind-body connection? We know that they're connected, but it's acknowledgement of that connection when movement has expression that you can make that connection as that neural pathway and all that technical stuff happening. It, do we get stuck on our wording while we're actually trying to get people to move? Or do you think that we are just, we're just not aware of it? I think that we have a lot of untapped human potential and sometimes we just need somebody to give us permission. And I know that doesn't sound the best, but a lot of us, I think, are waiting to be told we even have access to that, you know? Okay. And, and especially because, so I have a background working with more like people in corporate tech or <laughs> people who are working in politics and they're working like, you know, 12 to 16 hour days, um, that, that type of population. And, um, and nonprofit workers and stuff like that. And I think they're just so busy in their lives. They don't have a moment to go, oh, what does it feel like? What does my belly do when I breathe in and out? You know, they don't, I don't think there's a moment to think about that. And even I remember, you probably relate to that. I remember physically not feeling good at my job and just powering through constantly. Right. Just and, on cruise control, just trying to fight through falling asleep on your couch with your shoes on just like stuff that you're just like this isn't normal how humans are supposed to live i think that's right. even more why i as i was doing pilates more i was like looking at my job my desk job and looking up pilates and i was like one is one is not healthy 
It's great. good. I'm doing some great stuff, but I'm unable to be a good actor in my own life. I can't support mm. my family. I can't support people. Yeah, I have money, but there's something beyond money, which is actual relationships. And right. money's important. I'm not saying money's not important. We need money. But sometimes it's worth taking the pay cut in order to do something where you actually are alive. Yeah, and you, I smile so much teaching Pilates. Mm -hmm. And at my old job, I was more, de felt defeated daily, you know? Yes. And it's more because I couldn't do the big macro work that I seen needed to be done. But now I'm realizing I'm almost two years out that taking a step back in looking at the Pilates sphere, my skills and skills like that you have that we've, you know, built in other places, they transfer. They transfer, absolutely. And it's just not something you notice right away. I was like, okay, well, Pilates is here, politics is here, and I compartmentalize them. No, everything overlaps. Nothing's mutual exclusive. Politics is everywhere. It's political where your studio is located, who's coming in your studio, you know, whether or not um, just who your teachers are. So many right. things. Right. And exactly. And so I had a, a moment where it was just like, I need to figure out how to bring my community organizing and public affairs skills into the Pilates sphere and figure out ways to get people more politically active. So they understand the political climate around them. I mean, I have so many ideas, but I'm also someone who has a small business, which I never even mentioned. And I yes. also have a part-time job and on top of all of that, I'm in school. I'm a student. I'm always a student, even when I'm not in school. But, you know, <laughs> I, I'm that person where I just tack on stuff. Yes. And I tack on. And it used to be because I wanted a really fancy resume. Now it's because I have an issue with saying yes. Or no. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. That's you hit it on the mark. I. And it's because so I genuinely want to help. I genuinely want to come. And I have so much energy. So I'm like, give me something to do. And then I'm like, wait, I have a giant to-do list. Right. <laughs> so how do you marry all of these things? They, they all transfer together. But now, what is the end goal? With all these things that you're putting together, how does that fit? What does that look like? I'm hoping that after I have my own website launch, which hopefully is going to be in the next few months, that I can teach more um, foam roller work and that sort of thing. And I can, through my own platform, because I teach on someone else's platform, that I can start incorporating more political education within my teaching. But I can't really do that on somebody else's platform. And right now yes. I'm teaching. So I do that in my one-on-one -on -one work with people, but I'd like to do that on a bigger scale. I'd also like to um, work with Pilates teachers in general to create a little bit more inclusive language for how they talk to people and especially okay. brand uh, like brand new teachers um, and kind of really pushing this idea that how we talk about Pilates to the every average day person, the non Pilates person is imperative right now. Um, yes. It always has been imperative, but it's even more imperative because there's, there's something going on. There's some sort of rapture. It seems like the definition of what Pilates is isn't even um, shared throughout with everyone. Um, That's why I open with your elevator pitch. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was, somebody told me recently that there was a white paper and it explained mm -hmm. kind of what Pilates was. And this was made like 25 years ago or something. And PMA had it and then they took it off their website because they didn't want to be like strong Boxed and fast. In. Yeah, yes. they didn't want, cause they wanted it to be less, they wanted it to be more fluffy and that it could work for anyone and be more of a chameleon. And yes. this, this is actually really bad for us as a whole. Cause then people, I guess somebody recently in some forum was like, what brand of Pilates do you teach? Well, mm. you don't teach a brand of Pilates. Maybe you had a specific certifying body, but that's not a brand. We're teaching Pilates. Everyone's teaching Pilates. And, right. you know, I, I really like to get away from this idea of 
this this ideology and dogma that says specific people are teaching Pilates only and that you're only teaching Pilates if you're teaching classical. No one is going and building a spine corrector for Pamela that they teach. No one's going and doing that. So anyone who's like, I teach just like Joe. No, you don't. You don't go in your garage afterwards and build a spine corrector for that back. You're not standing on someone's stomach. You're not wearing tiny little shorts. And, you know, you're probably not tactile cueing people to this extent. So, right. you know, you're in your, and you can't download a human being. You're never going to be Joe. No one's ever going to be Joe. We have to move. Right. We have to realize like he's a human entity person and, you know, he's a human and he's no longer alive and no one out here is kind of, I don't know. It's just amazing to me that, that there are people out there that say, I can tell you whether or not you're teaching Pilates or not. As yes. if they're, they're the end all be all. And it, to me, it's very like, it's mm -hmm. very high hierarchical, like, you know, and, and what is it? What did Toni Morrison say? If you can only feel tall, if someone else is on the knee, your, their knees, then you got a problem. Mm -hmm. And, and this is their problem. They're, they, I feel like it's like the kid who was cool in high school and peaked and they're like really trying to get back to that. <laughs> and, you know, and it's damaging. Yes. It's damaging because, you know, one of the first things I was told in Pilates that there was something, somebody couldn't tell if there was something wrong with my ankle or my hip. Some teacher right. said it to me. I don't know what's wrong with you, but there's something wrong with your ankle or your hip. I just took that with me for so long. I'm, I'm just functional. I need to be fixed. I need to find somebody to fix me. I need to find right. someone else to fix my body. Mm -hmm. um, that's parental. And no one can fix you. You're not someone that needs to be fixed. Right, right. This is, a, this is about working together to become, a, you know, the best version of you and to feel relief in your body. I mean, absolutely. that's number one. And I think, I don't think people get that, that at the end of the day, it's about feeling better and finding relief and in, in facilitating that for other people because we're sitting a lot we're uncomfortable maybe we're hunched over when I first started Pilates I was really like this and I'd be like why is my neck hurt why is my shoulder pinch and I don't have that I can turn my head and I don't get that warm thing where I'll, like your <laughs> neck do you know what I'm talking right. about yeah absolutely um, I have clients with that yes yeah and I, that happened to me most of my life growing up and it only stopped within the last few years. And so how, I mean, I think you said it. I watched one where you were talking about how someone's interviewing people around Joseph Pilates, the, the not, yes. the, the non-usual suspects and some yes. janitor or somebody who you, who the barber, served, told me, the barber. Yeah. Told and me he, the barber, had, yes. he had PTSD and it was helping with that. I have diagnosed PTSD and it, I know for a fact it's help mm -hmm. and that it helps me each and every day live my life and interact yes. with people in a better way and deal with my triggers better. And I mean, I don't, it's just, so, so I laugh every time I see, oh, Pilates for weight loss. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Pilates is to get that crink, kink out in your neck. Pilates is to help you realize where you are in space and build proprioception and know that, oh, this doesn't feel that great. I'm just going to roll on the roller for a moment. You know, it gives you this so, sense that you know what to do, right? So, so do, you, do you cringe at when people use Pilates as part of their marketing? Like Pilates for weight loss, Pilates for golf, Pilates for fill in the blank does that is, are you saying that you don't like that no I think that's great to do like Pilates for golf you know you're doing it specifically for a swing you know even though I don't like golf um it's more that when someone's saying that that's one of the main benefits because I do see that especially here in California um it's that's one of the top three usually helps with weight loss tone and so Pilates, so Pilates for back pain Pilates for mental health Pilates for See, and that's great if we're talking about all of it, but Pilates has not been proven to be an effective weight loss system. You need to go see a registered dietitian. You need to go do a real route. If you're going to your Pilates instructor for nutrition advice, please, please go the other way. No one should be, there's a scope of practice that we have and it does not include nutrition. I'm not learning about nutrition. I've never 
had that moment. And that's really for a doctor to decide with you, you know? And so then, sorry. So then I agree with that because like we, we need to know when to refer. And we've talked about that on the show many times, but then you look at return to life through contrology and Joe supplies is telling us how to sleep, how to eat, what to do when we, you know, how to, you know, go outside, get more telling us about vitamin D, all those different things. So when you call it a con- complete exercise system and then Mr. Pilates branches out into areas that are quote unquote are outside of the scope. Do you feel like that was what gives other Pilates instructors modern day the ticket to say, you know, well, how was your sleep last night? Like I'm not registered in, I don't know what the title of the term is for someone who specializes in sleep, but you know what I'm saying? Like, where, well, like where's the line that we draw with that? I mean, I think it comes back to the fact that when he was writing this, this was how people wrote. And I think it's even happening now. Like, look at someone like the medical medium. Um, We have a point where things can be the cult of individualism. And with that cult of individualism, we see some person as the... um, the knowing all being person. This person can now dictate my life and tell me what to do. And it's the best thing for me. And I think we have to be really careful of that and who are getting our information from and just taking things as fact and taking things as what's right for me. I think at that time when he was writing that book, that this was kind of the, you know, we were all talking about this complete balance of life. And um, I think people were after this, this idea of wellness. So it was really at the time, super prevalent, I think, to speak like all of the aspects of things. And it is right, you know, dry brushing couldn't be helpful, you know, but are when you're teaching Pilates, is your job to talk about dry brushing and vitamin D or is it to really start talking to them about the way their spine moves and stuff like that? To me, it, it just goes, yeah. it goes back to that. Are we just puppets who regurgitate everything that we've heard just because we read it in a book that might've been edited by somebody else or, mm-hmm. or that was edited and maybe things have been added and we don't know if it's, you know, Or do we work with our clients where they're at? And when our client says, hey, you know, I'm really concerned about weight loss, we go, hey, do you know that Pilates has actually not been proven to be the most effective, you know, thing to do for weight loss? And if you're interested in weight loss, maybe you should talk to a dietitian, somebody that's registered and that, you know, knows what they're talking about. Just because I, I see, you know, people just seem to give a lot of advice. And I think it comes back to assumptions. Yes. People are assuming that when someone comes to physical wellness, that they're trying to change their body. And I think that that's something that we have to kind of move away from. Well, actually, sir, can I stop you there? Um, I think when people open with this dialogue that people come with the assumption that we're going for weight loss, that hasn't been my experience in talking with people because most people who – come to whether it's Pilates or even fitness world, one of the questions we've been taught, because most people have started in some big box gym where they, they ask you, what are your fitness goals? Because the, the objective is to sell you a big package. So they train you to say, what are your goals? So we start with the question, what are your goals? And then go from there. So I think that, yes, there is the assumption in general that people are going at it saying like I need to this person is coming to sign up for applies because they need to lose weight or they need to change your body let's get you on that path but I think really that is people are starting more with the question of what are your goals and because of what we're seeing in social media there's more of a focus on wellness and uh, mind body and you know this holistic approach to it so generally speaking, fitness professionals are coming at it from the perspective of, okay, I might not get a weight loss goal anymore because people understand that being strong is healthy. People understand that getting rest is healthy. People understand that X, Y, and Z is healthy, not just a six pack. Like I think that, would you, would you say that there's a shift from chasing after six pack to now looking at a new definition of health and wellness? For me, yes. Um, I don't know if that's across the board because so like, I don't have a background in a big box gym. Mm -hmm. I've 
I've worked in a gym once, but it was at the University of California and it was, you know, they're next to their research facility. So it was just like mm -hmm. a specific group of people who are coming in and yes. um, people were concerned about their physical appearance. I mean, I'm in California. This is like, I mean, I kind of think that this is a thing people talk about here a lot. Um, the, mm -hmm. the Pilates studio I worked at, right when you walk in, there's a thing of fat, a brick okay. that shows yes. what, what five pounds of fat looks like or something. I think yes, it's because those. of the, and, and like that's fat phobic and disturbing and it's messed up and it immediately makes somebody um, feel triggered if, this is something that they've had to work through in their life and they've had to move to body neutrality. Maybe they've had body dysmorphia or they've really not liked themselves physically and maybe mm -hmm. seeing something like that could just immediately make them. And I think that that's sure, where right. I'm coming from is I've worked in studios where, yes, weight loss was the number one thing people were talking about. Um, I interviewed for a job down in LA when I briefly lived there uh, last year and the first thing the studio or the studio owner was so excited when she saw my resume when she seen yes. me in physically in person her first question was do you work out not do you do pilates she didn't mm. ask me if i do pilates she asked me if i worked out every day and i thought that was such an like an offensive thing to ask because it Absolutely. has nothing to do with pilates and uh, you know i'm not a super like I'm not very like a big person either. So if we're in Southern California and I'm a size eight and you're looking at me like I'm a terrible person and you're just like, you know, I don't know if you're going to fit in with all my trainers because my trainers are very itty bitty. You know, that's disturbing because that means this environment isn't inclusive to people of different mm -hmm. bodies. And I think that's where I come from is like, I'm in California. This is the focus. People are obsessed with weight and body. And if you looked up a lot of the studios around here, I think that that's what we'd see. We have a lot of mega reformer studios and that kind of okay. stuff. And, yes. You know, and we're, you know, LA is probably way more like that than here. But when the beach is close, I think, you know, people do think about that. I would think it would be even more like that in somewhere like Miami. But for me, I've unfortunately, that's, a thing I hear a lot are people go, yes. well, I want my, um, I want my butt to be higher. I want this. It's all, it's a physical thing. I mean, I, I still have friends who, and I'll be like, that's really not the point of what we're doing, but you know, I'll <laughs> yes. do some stuff with you. So you feel your butt. So you think right, that's what's for sure. happening. If that's, if that's your objective. Yeah, we can do a few of that, but I'm also going to do the stuff that I know because I know you need to do some side bending and stuff just, you know, yes. so it's like, we, 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 you want to help your client and you want to do what they want. But there's also, I think what you were alluding to earlier is you still want to nudge people in directions a little bit, or at least show them that there is another, uh, there's opportunities and options and get them curious about it. Yes. Give them what they want. Make sure you're sneaking in what they need. And I mean, I, I don't even know if I sneak it in. I just say, hey, you know, I think this would be really great for you. Do you like this? And if yeah. people don't like it, I find another way. I, I mm -hmm. really do like to keep people, like you just said, give the people what they want. If that's yes. what, if somebody want, if somebody comes to you and they just want to do monkey, you know, get their body all warmed up and then go get them in monkey. You know, mm. that's because the, the whole point is you want them to have fun and want to do Pilates. So then they go talk to random person and they're like potties is awesome right yes that's exactly. the ultimate goal is to widen mm -hmm. the scope of who does it so then you know randomly someone that you don't even know is like oh i know what potties is it's not yoga and you'll be like yes we're moving <laughs> in the right direction yes i i don't know i think it's really situational it's really like being in the bay area and being in san francisco um i think there is this idea of your body being like your calling card in a way. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be a thing, but I definitely see that in our industry that people try to, they try to use that or people see people as legitimate based on their body. I mean, when I first started, I thought I'm never going to be successful at this because I'm weird and I'm not like a lot of the people I see. 
and mm -hmm. I wear sweatpants instead of stretchy clothes. And you know what I mean? You just look around and you're like, I'm never hey, going to do I don't that. fit this mold, so, right. So I shouldn't even be in this space. Mm -hmm. And I know other people feel that. I know, uh, you know, um, Michelle Sims just put out an article on Bounce Body yes. Core, and that's same thing, you know? A right, lot of us sure. don't feel like we really are allowed to be in this industry that we're represented mm -hmm. or that people see us as legitimate. Right. You, you know, I think if some person through a specific lineage came to my class, they'd be like, what is she, what are they teaching? Why would they add a, a chair to this? Why would, you know, and I move yes. between, I sometimes for one exercise, I give people like six options. So yes, I, I think some people would be like, why are you doing so much? For sure. I mean, you can't satisfy everybody, nor can you try to accommodate everybody. So that's that, that's going to be out there. And I, I that's what I love about these conversations that we cross paths with everyone, with people that represent the 3 billion people on this planet. There's people who look different, act different, speak different, whatever. And for that, there needs to be that representation out there in our Pilates space and the fitness space, generally speaking. So that's, um, I think that's all good. And I think that what you are doing for your population and broadening the conversation is crucial. Yeah, I mean, what's crucial is the, the work you're doing, core conversations. I mean, this is amazing. I, I've i gone back and you've even said it before, just listen to it in the background while you're doing something else, you know? Um, Cause sometimes I'm, you know, busy doing other things, but I've learned so much from core conversations that I didn't know. And a lot of our programs are watered down and um, you don't learn about the lineage backgrounds. You don't learn about the different schools. I mean, I was two years in when someone was like, do you know, you know, Romana exercises or something? And I was just like, you should have saw my face. I just was like, <laughs> I literally, I literally like leaned in and was like, could you repeat that? And yes. I, I remember going to a mentor and being like, why didn't you tell me any of this? And they're like, well, you need to figure it out. And I'm like, how come this isn't in my manual? Yeah. Like, right. what are you, I supposed to figure it out. Can you point me in a direction or send me a list of books or just like, just give me a tiny little morsel. And I don't yes. need like people to tell me what to do. Cause I'm really mm -hmm. anti that. I think we should be figuring things out and, creating those strategies and tactics. Mm -hmm. But can we set people up for success a little bit? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> just like a little bit. You know, yes. I, I mean, I it's just like what I said at the beginning. If you would have told me that community organizing was a positive thing when I was in third grade, that I wouldn't still internalize the work as me not doing the right thing. I still have a moment where I'm like, wait, should I be saying this, you know? Yes. And and it's from older adults internalizing and telling me that was, and so we have to think about there's a child in all of us still, and there's people that haven't dealt with their stuff. And so when we're in a space and if we're telling people they're dysfunctional, it's your alignment, you're in pain because your alignment, you know, this yes. is so damaging for people. And if you look at the current manuals, this is how they teach. You need to be in the specific alignment. If you're not in this alignment, pain is so much more complicated than that. Right. Right. Exactly. Those are all the things we always need to be vigilant for, to look out for. Yes. Make let's them, make it better. Feel better. So I, I have not just like ignored the comments and the dialogue that's been happening in the comment section as we've been having this conversation. I just want to say thank you to everyone like for um, bringing up all these different points. And I realized that you were making a comment earlier about the recommendations that came out in the Pilates studio where people would act beyond their scope of practice and expertise. And then Roots Reef Pilates, uh, Explore Pilates were also saying that, yes, you've seen that happening and um there's a lot of stuff that happens in our world that i like that we've had this conversation today where we can talk about those things thank you once again right at the outset for talking about pronouns and identity as opposed to preference i, I really appreciate that piece of the conversation right out of the gate um, and in the replay i hope that people catch that as much as they catch the conversation around alignment and everything else that we've touched on here. So Rachel, thank you so much.
Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm always like nervous about stuff like this because you know you don't know what you're going to talk about, and I'll even have to watch it and I'll be like, oh, did I really say that? And I think well, it's I think it's yes. great for us. I just think it's good for us to practice this muscle. Absolutely, absolutely, and to lean into those moments of discomfort and understanding and i my personal thing and i teach my my boys this too is that seek to understand people first always seek to understand people first so you may have said something that i disagree with i would still take time to understand what you're saying ask two more questions before making a judgment call or dismissing you as or all these different things that people just naturally do if we take a moment to seek understanding that will help our understanding just in general. So, so once again, thank you so much for this chat today. I really, really do appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. I hope you have the best day and I'm excited to listen to more of these and just learn. All right. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Smart body movement.